Aha. Okay. This is some um, nice confirmation of um, some of my planning suppositions here that only about 30% of you have actually done basic color theory before, um, which is something about our education, isn't it? That you're compelled to spend 12 years in school, years in university, um, and you get constantly hassled about the level of your English or Japanese, Kokogo, French, Chinese, whatever your need native tongue is um, with all these young people these days, they haven't mastered the national language, blah, blah, blah. And what takes kind of five minutes to introduce people to um, key thing in uh, our visual culture, they never bother to stick in the curriculum. Okay. Uh, oops, sorry. There was a typo. There should be no, I've never studied color theory. There was the other annoying thing with zoom that actually you can't just cut and paste um, one uh, poll into another got to retype it. Okay. Wow. Okay. Lots of people who like sketching. That's fantastic. Maybe this is a classic sample bias story that a lot of people have self-selected into this class because they're intrinsically interested in that. Okay. Um, not so many people think they can never learn drawing. That's really good. Okay. Um, I'll say something about that in a moment. Once the, once it's gone, uh, the poll's done with. Okay. Right, uh, looking at our responses, still only about half of, oh no, 79. I think pretty much everyone's, everyone's done it. Okay, in that case, look, I'll, um, I'll end the poll straight away and show you the results. Okay, um, if anyone's still doing it, I think there's only two. So, okay, I'll end this and show you the results. Okay. And I've just screenshotted that myself. Okay, excellent set of results. We'll take some notes on that. Um, as we see, never started art theory. Uh, color theory is about a half of you okay um, so the uh, the ones have had who have were the ones who joined us a little bit later that fits my image of art students that's cool okay like to paint a sketch okay paint or sketch 46 uh, percent cool okay um, bad at drawing and don't think I can ever learn. Fortunately, only 14%. One of the really interesting things that comes through uh, talking to professors, uh, instructors in design schools is that they say that anyone at any age can be taught to draw. That's not necessarily true for music, uh, but is much truer for drawing. And so if you're a bit traumatized by not being able to draw very well, and I fit myself into that category because my mother and brother are brilliant at it. And I've always had envy. I think that's why I never went to architecture school in the end, even though I would like to have done. Um, then there is plenty of hope for you. Want to learn 44%? Yep, there's some pretty cool books around actually. Um, read this book and be become very good at drawing. There's a couple of great uh, YouTuber channels about um, learning to do watercolor, watercolor painting, for example. That's good. Like going to art galleries, 46%. Uh, excellent result. Indeed, my going to an art gallery when I was 19 was a huge impetus for me in coming to Japan, as you've already heard. The Idemitsu um, Museum sent an exhibition to my home city of Sengai, Japanese calligrapher from the Edo period, and had me really get interested in Japan and then led me to going there. Um, so yeah, the things that happen in art galleries, okay? Um, fall in love, fall out of love, um, get inspired to do something different with your life in art galleries. Okay, 65% of people say that art is important. Um, hopefully we'll bring the other uh, third around, okay? Um, one of the things when we talked about 
design thinking and redescription was this notion that actually the liberal arts can help us to expand our uh, sense of empathy to see other people's life experience. And so at least some forms of art can, can do that perhaps. So they can, they can encourage higher levels of engagement with the other um, to whom we might be a little bit psychologically indifferent. So in terms of changing the world for the better, there are actually interesting psychological, perception, cognitive reasons for arguing that art might make a difference. Monochrome, 47%, good. Um, I like monochrome and don't like colorful clothes, right? Only 10%. Okay, so, you know, there are, my son in, goes to interior design school, and everyone dresses in kind of Yoji Yamamoto and whatnot. Um, and so the kind of the default uniform is white, black and black and gray, um, except for the, the few eccentrics who do crazy things with color. Um, it seems they like to stick color on their hair, but uh, not on their clothes, my son's cohort. I remember he um, went to a quite serious boys school in high school and midsummer he had bright red hair um, and uh, a bunch of his mates were sharing pictures of him on social media and it turned out that their Tanya no sensei was following them on social media, which is a bit kind of freaky. And although he came back looking Junjapa, too Junjapa actually with bleach black hair, and obviously with a father like me, that didn't make sense. The teacher called him over and said, hmm, Nihonji ni modori mashita mi taina. No, ano, akai kami no kewa, which was all a bit kind of weird. Okay, uh, so we've got lots to do today, and I'll um, turn my attention to that now. Uh, we've got the ideating exercise about what is the, the redescription exercise, what is the nature of the university, uh, the university campus, what does it mean, who, what, how does it function, uh, what does it evoke uh, in terms of images and whatnot. Uh, but we'll come back to that because it doesn't make much sense to interact and then just stop and then for me just to talk the whole time. So I think what we'll do, first of all, uh, I'll actually be... Um, we'll, we'll go to 11a, text and image. Uh, but before I do that, um, one of your classmates, let me go into chat. One of your classmates has uh, posed a question to me and I'll read it out. Do you mind helping us get a big picture idea of the topics we've covered so far? I'm not sure what format the quiz is going to take. I'll say something about that later on. Um, Concern is sometimes in class, I'm not sure what how the concepts relate back to the practical skills. Okay, and therefore might not understand the questions on the quiz. Okay, um, right here. So, okay. Um, add text, what you mean by about copywriting, for example. Yes, yes. And then the theory and the examples and fitting it all together. Okay, so yeah, good, good set of issues there. Yeah, first of all, when we talk about copy, uh, yeah. Um, Normally we talk about the actual text in advertising. Um, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the relationship between the text and um, image and these questions of image being open. So I'll, I'll bear that question in mind when we speak, uh, when we talk about that. Um, yeah, uh, let me see, in terms of the relationship between the, uh, the theory and um, practice, I guess there are several levels here. The, uh, I'm, at this point, I'm primarily thinking in terms of how the theory informs two elements. Um, one, in terms of the direct practice of communication, how we think about any kind of communication act. And a lot of the theory simply reminds us that, uh, well, it it's simply offers, offers us a warning, a quite sophisticated warning, that uh, we may have a very clear sense of what we want to communicate to others, uh, but other people will find their own meanings in a message at the other end. In some sense, that's obvious, uh, but actually the theory helps to really understand the extent to which, which, which this systematically happens. And, and so much of the theory, whether it's um, cognitive psychology, whether it's semiotics, you know, whether it's postmodernist theory, really talks or, uh, about how we, as individuals, make meaning. We find meaning in the world. Uh, we construct cultures, identities, 
Uh, we navigate the world through narratives, through stories about the world and how we internalize those stories to ourselves. So in fact, in many ways, actually seeing and being in, in the world is actually very much a communicative act. It's often an internal communicative act. Um, so we're always armed with stories. There are some, several implications of this in terms of communication practice. First of all, if you want to change people's behavior, telling them uh, you've been doing it wrong is the real way to do it. For the most part, doesn't work unless people choose to self-select into that story. So it's okay as clickbait. You know, um, you might click on something. If, you know, people are afraid of doing something wrong, but they don't want to be told they've been doing something wrong by someone who's in their face. You choose to go to a place where someone gives you an alternative perspective that's different. But so we're not going to try to change people's minds um, by telling them they've been wrong. What we can do is give them more stories. And if, in, the, in a sense, the theory tells us that we construct our world through narratives, through stories. So you can, in a sense, arm people or equip people with either better stories, if you just want the world to be a better place, um, or from a selfish point of view, more convenient stories, get people believing your story so that they act in ways that you want them to act. Um, so that's, that's one key aspect. Another aspect, of course, is this perspective, particularly from postmodernism, that people will often play with or subvert or manipulate um, messages. And particularly when messages are very clearly designed to make you do something that's in the interests of the person sending that message, then people are going to, as a defense of themselves, um, kind of push back on that. And we see a remarkable degree of savvy amongst um, even very small kids, for example, in playfully um, messing with the messages that they get from adults. You know, three-year-olds and four-year-olds are remarkably good at taking, excuse the expression, taking the piss out of their kindergarten teachers um, by manipulating what they say, parroting what they say, um, because kids are wonderful mimics and uh, we all learn through mimicry. You know, the whole practice of kanji, rewriting kanji and all the rest of it is, is a process of mimicry till you master it. And so we're, we're hardwired to this. The, traditionally, the transmission of, techno of, of technology and know-how was, know was all through um, mimetic approach, a kind of a mimic money, money sort of you know, copying kind of approach. Um, so people are good at that. Uh, but we don't just simply faithfully copy messages. We uh, playfully manipulate them. Uh, in broader discussions about creativity, we often say that much creativity comes about because we actually slightly misunderstand um, messages. We uh, often say that, you know, great art or great, great, um, maybe not science, but uh, certainly great art and a lot of great philosophy, great writing, uh, grows out of misunderstanding what the master was telling you. I think very often there's a very deliberate kind of um, subversion of what we're being told in interesting ways. So theory gives us some general stories about how the world works. So this is the intermediate dimension and then there are implications for practice. Now, how does that carry over into the, uh, the quiz? Um, it's gonna be a bit of everything. Um, actually, the main thing with the quiz as I, I sent him a message earlier was just to, give you an incentive to just look back over the notes. Um, uh, there'll be 20 questions. I've, I've got the questions done, but I haven't actually formatted them yet. So um, I'll be putting them up later on. They'll go live. I'll send everyone a, um, a message through the, uh, the Moodle system and then follow up with Navi so you know it's gone live. And um, you'll, you'll have an hour to do it. There's no rush to do it, but I'll close it off. Um, I said five o'clock on Friday, but I'll close it off at midnight on Friday because uh, I know you've got lots of other things going on. So it's only 5%. It's just simply 20 multiple choice questions, uh, which covers material, okay, um, that we've looked at so far, and particularly the uh, the slides, okay? So really, I'm just encouraging you to go back and, and look through the slides and get some sense of it. I don't think the questions will be too difficult for people who've done a, a basic review. And uh, as I said to the introduction of business class last week, one of the things that has surprised me, I'm generally not looking very closely at the metrics that come through on the um, on Moodle, but I have surprised, been a bit surprised how many people actually um, 
haven't downloaded the lecture notes uh, less than the, the full class. In fact, the funny thing is sometimes there are more people who participated in um, the class online than people have downloaded the lecture notes. Maybe because you're confident I'm going to put the videos up and I, have, I haven't for the last two weeks, but I will. Um, so maybe that's a factor there. Maybe you think you can get to them anytime, or maybe a whole bunch of people are actually just forwarding the login details to their grandma who's watching the lecture instead of them. And grandma doesn't know how to load down the download the lecture details or something. I don't know. Anyway, so do review those lecture notes. Okay, so let's uh, go over to the discussion of text and image. Right. Okay. So image versus text. Okay. Obviously complementarity of images and text is universally recognized. Uh, we have this expression in English, a picture tells a thousand words. Uh, clearly, of course, this image can, can convey so much information that would take um, many words to well describe. And so that's where we get this expression from. On the other hand, of course, a few choice words can give us a profound insight into, say, a psychological state or a particular moment in lived experience in, in the philosophical sense, in some form of phenomenological sense, that a fixed image or even a moving image doesn't necessarily capture. And there's a lot of debate about which actually carries more information. Uh, very young children can learn very, or do learn very, very quickly to read um, the very subtle move, muscular movements of the human face, 100 and something movements of the human face, which evokes uh, so many emotional states. And kids have to do that because they're so dependent upon adults to nurture them um, and provide and provide safety and uh, of course adults can be a, th a threat too if they're incredibly grumpy um, so we get a lot of information for, particularly from uh, human interaction through movement and one of the, uh, the things you would have discovered of course is that uh, the still image very often does a horrible injustice to the particular uh, impression that someone uh, creates in in real life uh, very often the persona which is so much embodied in uh, so many things like their body language their movements uh, in general don't carry across with a, a particular um, fixed image the the art of the uh, of portraiture is actually not about fixing just one split second as photography inevitably is but actually about encompassing so much of that information that you see from the close observation of, of someone over many, many hours, bringing that into a single uh, representation. So although we often tend to assume that portraiture, like photography, uh, portraiture and art is a similar kind of process of fixing someone in time, you're actually, what you're doing is you're, you're taking a summary of a person across time and then fixing it in, in one image. So the relationship between text and image becomes very, um, very contentious. Uh, those of you who go to art galleries regularly, and it's about uh, half of you at least, uh, know that experience of seeing a painting uh, or an installation or whatever, engaging with it, and then going to look at the title. Sometimes we go and look at the title for a hint to try and make, make sense of what we're actually seeing. Sometimes we just simply want to know the title uh, so that we can talk about it to someone else. So the, because this particular work has made uh, an impact upon us. Okay. Now, if we think about human evolution, evolution, and I saw some caves in France gives us huge clues to this. Uh, some of the oldest instances of uh, human image making in the world, uh, we can see that generally image making precedes text and text is derivative of images. Uh, those of you who are interested in the history of kanji, of you know, Chinese characters, you can see this. Uh, uh, the textbook I used actually to teach myself kanji, I never really took Japanese classes, uh, actually started off with the origins the, of uh, each particular kanji, of the key elements of the kanji, where they were derived from, Typically, they were ideographs. They started off as actually, before ideographs, they were 
actual representations of something in the in the physical world then they became abstracted to represent an idea or sometimes multiple ideas and then combinations of them so we've moved from image making to text uh pictures of you know bison cattle horses people spearing them all of those kind of kinds of things uh, of course, also image making was very much about leaving your own mark as well, too. Uh, if we see a lot of Aboriginal art in Australia, a lot of very ancient works that go back 30, 40,000 years with Aboriginal settlement in Australia. Um, one common way of image making was actually to grind uh, coloured sands to apply some kind of paste to the wall and then put the sand in your mouth and actually to put your hand up and to then spray the sand around your hand and leave the outlines of your hands. And you can see this, of course, that uh, uh, this gives a sense of community units and whatnot as well. You see different sized hands, so kids, you know, um, women, men, for example, and many of them uh, overlaid. So this, uh, impulse, human impulse to actually leave your mark on the world is a very significant thing. And uh, in the context of uh, you know, new sensitivity to, well, it's not that new, uh, uh, protecting the environment, it's been very much a, a strong notion for several centuries out of some cultures, uh, but in the context of global warming and whatnot, we often have narratives on the one hand about pristine nature, uh, which is almost never completely pristine, and uh, how human beings shouldn't be leaving any mark on it, but that actually is a, a distinctive kind of human impulse to actually make our mark on the on the world at large. Uh, but that also so many of the marks we've made in the past mirrored the natural environment in which people were historically so dependent. So we understand, of course, that although you start off as uh, making depictions of the representations of the world through image, that they can evolve to a very high level of abstraction. We see with Chinese and Japanese, for example. As the technology of text and image making diverge, this is one of our key themes here, um, image and text, be text become much more sharply delineated. And the increasing predominance of text and the diminishment of image in so many ways, except for limited purposes, and I'll just say something about that in a moment, has as much to do with the technology, technologies of reproduction that are available in certain periods, particularly um, from the 16th century until the early, early 20th century. Um, and it's only with changing technology do we see a reconvergence of text and image. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about the sacred. Of course, the sheer sophistication of language, it's conceptual and expressive potential. Also the scope for open interpretation that uh, texts can be understood in many ways. And if we look at a lot of religious scholarship, it's actually uh, about remarkable efforts to interpret particular parts of the text. We see this in Judaism, for example, that the, uh, the vast bulk of religious scholarship in the Judaic tradition with the, the Talmudic scholars is actually questions of interpretation uh, of key texts. And so this is an accumulated body of learning over many centuries. But also language provides enormous scope for private imagination. Uh, we can all read the same text and imagine different things. And that's the sheer potency of a very good text. Um, one of the attractions, of course, of text, particularly highly simplified text, uh, if when writing is widely taught, even when the technology is still handwriting, uh, the ease of copying, of transcribing. And indeed, in the case of sacred texts, a significant part of religious practice actually becomes the transcribing of texts. This is, of course, why the great monasteries of Europe became major reservoirs of knowledge, including secular scientific knowledge, because monks engaged day to day in the copying of texts and very fine calligraphic traditions, calligraphy traditions really come from that. Um, still today, of course, you can do this in a whole range of temples in Japan. You can go and practice writing Buddhist sutras as quite literally a meditative uh, practice. Of course, oral transmission as well, too. The monks in the great monasteries before the development of the printing press copied the Bible by hand. 
Then a Bible was carried by a priest uh, to largely illiterate communities. And the priest was a key interlocutor. The priest was someone who could read the text and um, help to apply the text, interpret the, uh, the word of God that was embodied in the text to otherwise uh, illiterate communities. So of course the text itself becomes a vessel of the sacred. Uh, so this of course means that the, the texts are venerated. And of course it's in a lot of societies, a very serious offense to treat a sacred text poorly. I have copies of Bible, the Quran, for example, in my office, and I'm very conscious about um, how I handle them, where they put them. I don't want to, to disrespect them. You know, if students come to my office, I don't you want a copy of the Quran lying on the floor, for example. You know, I should say, you know, suitable respect for this text because it means so much to to uh, to so many people of faith. Of course, the language itself of the sacred text uh, also becomes privileged very significantly. Hebrew, Aramaic, um, Greek, and actually one of the complicated things with the Old Testament is that uh, so much of the Old Testament and the New Testament are actually assemblage. These are people who have actually curated at certain junctures. Uh, texts have been curated. Uh, the uh, um, letters, for example, from, from various saints are a critical part of the New Testament. And these were written in multiple languages. So we see that a lot of Aramaic, which by the way, a version of Aramaic is still spoken by uh, very small communities in Syria. Uh, and uh, The Passion of the Christ, the film of a number of years ago, which is quite confronting, uh, actually has the actors speaking ancient Aramaic. They went and uh, found some Aramaic speakers and got to train the actors to actually train them how to, how to, how to speak in Aramaic. But these texts become quite privileged. So Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Latin, of course, until very recently, Latin was a critical part of the curriculum in uh, education for Catholics. Um, my father was a schoolboy in a very small town in Australia in the um, uh, the 19, the late 40s and the early 1950s, tiny little town called Kingaroy, population about 2,000, three, three hours from Brisbane. And there he was learning Latin because Catholic family and that was uh, the appropriate thing to do. Uh, we do see that in some fundamentalist Christian communities in the United States uh, teach Hebrew and Aramaic as a key part of their curriculum. So actually quite a lot of biblical scholarship uh, and indeed people who then go on to do Middle Eastern studies, uh, study contemporary Hebrew, comes about because people have actually had it through Christian schools. Arabic, of course, is hugely priv privileged in uh, the Arab world, and indeed the, the, the deep association between Arab, Arab culture and the language Arabic and Arab identity and Arab peoples, and is so much tied to the, uh, the language text uh, through which is the transmission of the words of the Prophet Muhammad. And of course, these very ancient Indian uh, languages, Sanskrit and Pali, which communicate uh, Buddhist texts, highly privileged, and then go on to influence such as languages such as Thai that I mentioned earlier. So as something becomes sacred, of course, the opposite arises too. The, the danger that one breaches religious precepts, that, that one gives offence, through not using language or image appropriately. Uh, and indeed we see very strict textual or spoken representations of God being restricted in some languages. I'll give you some examples here. Uh, we find, for example, in uh, Hebrew for, for Jews, uh, there are certain ways to refer to God that's acceptable, others that are not. Uh, so it's very often Hashem, the name, so it's as if the name that should not be spoken of, of God, so spoken in terms of, in a metaphoric kind of way. Uh, Yahweh is an interesting case, if anyone's interested, the Vatican in recent years banned it, and it's an interesting debate about why, why they banned that. Um, we see many Christian communities still refer to, um, to Yahweh. Uh, quite strikingly, uh, we see in some faiths uh, an explicit prohibition on visual representations of, of God 
and the prophets. And we see a huge split in the church during the Reformation on this, that uh, the Lutheran Protestant Reformation took seriously Exodus um, 20. Um, I've got here the King James Bible version or multiple versions, of course. Um, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. So in short, uh, devout Protestants, and really what was in a sense a very strong fundamentalist uh, movement in the Reformation, rejected the Catholic Church tradition of using visual representations, uh, that is, of course, paintings and uh, sculptures of Christ, of, the, of prophets, um, to uh, communicate the Christian faith to the ill-educated, the illiterate. So we see two, th two things out of this. Um, Protestant Bible study movement, Protestant efforts to spread um, reading. So we see so many missionaries, Protestant missionaries having, uh, seeing as a key role in a sense to convert and to civilize peoples is to actually teach people to read so that they could access the holy book themselves. Uh, to do away with a privileged priesthood who would be the interlocutors or the interpreters of what is in the Bible. Um, to let the, te the text speak directly to individuals, be a guide for individuals. So um, it's not all bad in terms of this really fundamentalist turn. Of course, it, it represents a huge assault on visual culture. And uh, indeed, the expression whitewashing in English, to whitewash, to cover things up. Whitewashing was part of a very aggressive fundamentalist movement uh, during the Reformation period in England, spilled over into the English Civil War as well, where zealots, and that's a Jewish reference, by the way, um, zealots ran around the English countryside with um, buckets of whitewash, uh, painting over all the graven images in churches. So it's a huge issue in terms of heritage in the UK. Um, these churches you go into with all the white walls, very often underneath them are very significant, very old Christian artworks that have been painted over. So do you say, well, for 350 years, this church has been white on the inside, or do you very carefully remove the whitewash in order to reveal the, uh, the, underworks, the, the, uh, the artworks that lie um, underneath? And this debate happens in a whole range of places. This is a debate that happens in Cyprus, where Christian churches were taken over and turned into mosques, for example, and paintings were, were painted over. Um, you do see in some places uh, very enlightened changes of religious domination, where they actually leave artworks intact. You can actually see this if you go to Hagia Sophia in Istanbul where it was a relatively uh, moderate Islamization of the city. And so if you go into Hagia Sophia, you can see, still see so many of the traces of um, Christian artworks that were there uh, from the uh, Greek Orthodox culture of the, the time that was displaced when the city was um, Islamized. Islamized. Uh, different branches of Christian church have different attitudes towards um, images. So in the Eastern Church, in the, uh, the Orthodox Church, uh, typically talk about it as the Greek Orthodox Church, where, where historically after particularly the, uh, the loss of Jerusalem to Christendom, then Constantinople uh, became the kind of the, the second Jerusalem. The priesthood of the Eastern Church used uh, Greek and uh, even today, uh, Greek Christian communities in Muslim countries are uh, often quite protected, quite, quite significantly so. Uh, with the fall of Constantinople, Russia took on a, uh, well, a self-appointed role as the protector of the Eastern Church. Now, the Eastern Church has a very fundamental place in its uh, practice of worship using icons using visual representations of 
key personalities in the Bible. And so you'll see this in, in all Eastern churches. And very often people will actually, they will, they will kiss the icon and they will, they will often have literally iconic images of, of key saints, um, which are like a talisman, for example, or, or mamori in many ways. So religious faiths in short elevated the importance of text, of course, highly standardized text. Uh, and so the guarding of text and then the guarding of images becomes a critical part of dealing with heretics mm -hmm. to try and make sure that there isn't um, splintering, doctrinal splintering, of course. Um, so this constrains the making of images, but it also very much concentrated the efforts of very talented uh, people who were artistically very talented on certain key themes. And so we see a real tension in terms of, you know, from an art history perspective, that you have extraordinarily talented people bringing their energies to religious art, but uh, very much limited themes. Now, we only see, in a sense, the rise of very substantial secular art in Europe uh, with the Protestant, the combination of the Protestant Re um, Reformation, but also effectively wealthy free states that become relatively liberal, and particularly places like Amsterdam, where you get a wealthy merchant class that become very interested in buying art, funding, buying art uh, that doesn't have religious themes. So the Flemish school, we see very strikingly the rise of landscape that is landscape for its own sake, rather than for some religious purpose. So as I've said here in the notes, the Catholic church and the Eastern Orthodox churches celebrate second and uh, two and three dimensional uh, depictions. Buddhism, of course, I think we all understand uh, not just is a visual, is overwhelmingly uh, a visual faith, very striking degree in both two and three dimensional senses. And it's one of the reasons for the enormous interest, uh, particularly after World War II in Western countries in Buddhism, because of just the sheer beauty of so many Buddhist um, images, sculptures. Uh, also more broadly, we, we see this notion of geomancy, um, geomancy is, is, is shape and form, but also projected very specifically onto landscapes. How we understand the structure of heaven and earth and how that can be mirrored in terms of the orientation of a building to landscape. This is feng shui in the Chinese sense. Uh, but also how this was tied to perceptions of authority. That if a uh, palace for a ruler, for example, oriented the wrong way, uh, the ruler's authority would be weakened, the ruler's effectively, the ruler's uh, judgment could be weakened. And uh, this notion of the way the heavens were organized should then be mirrored in terms of architecture, uh, mirrored visually, also became mirrored organizationally. So we talk, for example, in uh, governance culture from Confucian, which was imported into Japan as well, the minister of the left, the minister of the right, uh, these were actually ways of assigning authority that actually had some under, underlying assumptions about the way the heavens were organized and therefore the way um, organization of earth should happen as well too uh, with human authority. And we do see sometimes a very deliberate playing with this. One, one extreme case was actually um, during the Japanese colonization of Korea uh, where the Japanese in the Meiji period very deliberately built the Japanese governor's building smack bang in front of the um, Korean king's palace to mess with these geomantic principles. Um, and also in a very visual kind of very direct affront. So when the king looked out and uh, the, people, uh, the locals looked in, they saw this overwhelming, um, very um, hybrid, Western Japanese Meiji stone building boom, stuck smack bang in front of the palace. Uh, it was eventually um, pulled down brick by brick and relocated to somewhere outside Seoul. I, I, I went to it several times before it was uh, relocated because it was actually uh, the National Art Museum. It was a huge symbolic dilemma for the Korean government because it was also the building where the Republic of Korea was actually promulgated and the parliament first met. So it was quite a decision to actually kind of pull it down. 
Now to bring it back to technologies and this, this convergence and divergence and reconvergence of um, uh, print and, uh, uh, sorry, of text and image. Uh, historically, of course, tools of image making and text were shared, you know, stick pigments, brush, chisel, um, chisel uh, calligraphy brushes, all of these things we understand. Uh, clearly calligraphy and uh, painting uh, very closely tied arts and typically they came together in scroll paintings in the Eastern tradition. So we understand this, there's a whole bunch of other ways of making images as well too. Contact prints, rubbings, which was a, a tradition in Europe for pilgrims, for example, we understand this. Now, early printing technologies, woodblocks, for example, it's quite clear that when you're carving the woodblock and printing off them, that you can use equally text and image. And we see this with the ukiyo-e, they're always a combination of the both. Okay, um, once you move towards um, this block set where you have each individual letters, uh, where you can very speedily lay them out and, well, it was, it was quite labor intensive, uh, later on machine done, but actually setting text through block and mass printing, this became more difficult to apply to images because images you needed engravings, um, they could be chemical engravings through chemical etching, for example, various techniques, but became more intensive. So at this critical juncture, what happens is that text is easier to reproduce than image. This is why many old books and indeed many books still today, are overwhelmingly text with just a few images um, stuck in the middle. Unfortunately, so many of those beautiful prints, the antique prints that you can buy in print shops, uh, in so many stores in um, Western countries, in particular here in Tokyo, very often involve people finding old books, pulling out the um, prints and throwing away the, uh, the book, the text as a whole. So there is a very destructive dimension, unfortunately, um, in our very often love, and I've got to feel my walls at home, I must admit, uh, to have very fine um, prints on our antique prints on our walls. So we see a very significant difference across cultures in terms of whether uh, it's appropriate to use image, okay? And so some cultures become more visual cultures, some cultures become more textual cultures. I think as a generalization, we can say um, Jewish culture is much more of a textual culture rather than a visual culture. Uh, indeed, that's been a really big debate in terms of you know, Jewish architecture and uh, Jewish art making. Now, the very often Jewish art was quite in, informed by the host cultures of Jewish diaspora communities. And so different Jewish communities uh, show vastly different visual cultures based on whether they were in Morocco, uh, whether they were in Lithuania, for example. Of course, with growing specialized knowledge, we see an explosion of codified knowledge in both text and visual form, the diagram, presentation of data and whatnot. Um, now, in terms of the media, writing and image making become quite separate specializations and professions. So when I was a university student studying journalism, I had this very strange situation where I was a, uh, a student of journalism, but I was actually working as a photographer to pay my way through university. And it was impossible for me to then go and work on a newspaper as a journalist who took photos. We hear about photojournalists, but what a photojournalist was, was a photojournalist was actually a photographer for a newspaper. I originally wanted, I had this great idea when I was a high school student that I thought that's what I want to do. I want to do photographs and I want to write. Um, it was completely impossible. Uh, trade unions prevented uh, journalists from taking photos and the other way around. You had to be one or the other. Uh, digitization, new digital media, of course, people do both. And uh, so the new media has had a huge head start um, in this sense. And in fact, you have to be more than that. It's not just a still photographer, you have to be a, a videographer as well. So you see this, that uh, people are going to press conferences for the new media and even as stringers, as freelancers for the old media, uh, where effectively they're doing a little bit of everything. So part of the reason for this, of course, is just digitization. But also we do see, when we get into the 20th century in particular, in the second half of the 20th century, um, the costs of producing 
image rich publications fall dramatically. I won't bore you with all the, uh, the reasons in terms of the processing and printing technologies and whatnot. We get these enormous booms in glossy books and magazines, cooking, travel, architecture, and whatnot. Digitization has even further accelerated this, of course. Um, now that particularly we have lots of, of bandwidth, good uh, compression, uh, compression technologies. Um, I'm old enough to remember that uh, all images that were uploaded were um, uncompressed. And uh, so anyone put a photo, just one photo on a website, it took forever to load. Of course, we now have very, very sophisticated um, JPEG, MPEG, you know, so many different um, compression technologies. And of course, with large memory capacities as well too, the, the ability to use visualization has become so much more potent. The very fact that we're actually doing this, you know, you're, you're getting a visual stream through my phone, okay? Um, and we're all doing this through our computers. Um, simply shows how far we've come, come with this, of course, okay? Um, but also in a philosophical sense, in, in some sense, everything is reduced back to a mathematic language. All text and all images in our digital age are really just uh, uh, zeros and ones, okay, uh, with algorithms for the reassembly. So, so text and image has been completely reunified. And there's interesting questions of authenticity as well, too. Um, you take a picture uh, that looks like the original, but it is a representation of the world. Um, and then, of course, you if you're on... Um, Instagram or whatever, an algorithm makes it look like it's an old chemical photograph that was taken, for example, with a Polaroid. So let's speak to the, uh, the photograph. One of the most famous texts on this is Susan Sontag, who was a very interesting um, New York-based intellectual, she's often read as a popular philosopher, um, hugely influential individual, uh, ruthless self-promoter. There's a, there's a new biography of Susan, Susan Sontag out. Um, she was a great writer. Um, one philosopher made the kind of scathing comment that she could build a whole theory from a potato peel. Um, but uh, that, that determination to actually find bigger truths in mundane objects is one of Susan Sontag's interesting capabilities. I'll say something more about her view of photography in a moment. Um, Roland Barthes, we'll come back to when we talk about theory. Well, I'll do a, I'll do a video on demand very specifically. Um, camera Lucida. So he was very much prompted by when sorting out his beloved mum's mum's things, mother's things after she'd passed away, to reflect on the significance of the image when he came across a photo of her. I mentioned Walter Benjamin as well, a very famous text. And uh, he was a, uh, a German Jewish intellectual who was fleeing the Nazis. And uh, he got to border town, very south of France with Spain, um, and he feared the Nazis were catching up with him and unfortunately committed suicide there. Uh, but his text, the work of art in the age of mechanical reprodu uh, reproduction is still hugely influential. It's Susan Sontag. Um, she was the partner for the last 15 years of her life of the hugely talented, famous uh, photographer, Annie Leibowitz, who didn't take this picture. Um, so what's Sontag saying on photography? Um, it, it can be treated as a narrowly selective transparency, but to, despite the presumption of veracity or truth that, give, that gives all photographs authority of interest or seductiveness, um, the work that photographers do is no general generic exception to the usually shady commerce between art and truth. So what she's saying is that photographs have this appearance of absolute authenticity, of absolute truth, but very often they're highly selective, highly representation in what they say. Um, one of the interesting things, of course, is they present an, the opportunity to take an enormous number of angles and perspectives on the one event or object. And some interesting art projects do this, particularly now when everyone can upload images. So we see that interesting events involve the participants uploading images in the different takes on the same event. That said, the other interesting thing with photography is that uh, we have so many iconic images that we tend to think about the authentic view or the appropriate or the, the most accurate view of something, uh, of, of a thing like a mountain, like Mount Fuji, is from a certain position. So, you know, if you get to go to uh, um, a couple of Greek islands that are much photographed, you see enormous numbers of people pull up to all take the same photograph from the same place, because particularly in Santorini, there's a certain spot where you take the sunset that looks right. 
once you've taken the same picture that everyone else has taken from the same angle, you can say that you've seen the authentic Santorini, which is quite a weird thing. Um, Sontag says that photography is really practiced as an art. It's mostly a social right, a defense against anxiety, a tool of power. Um, they memorialize families, arguably even validate them. We must be a happy family because we took a picture together of everyone smiling. Um, arguably, photography actually grew with the fragmentation of families, with tourism and mass society. And Sontag is wonderfully bitchy to read. And if you think about it, there's so much scope to be bitchy about photographs. You know, when, when there's no, nothing more to talk about in a family gathering or, or a gathering of others, what do you do? We take a kine and shashim, we take a, we take a picture together. And in a funny kind of way, we resort to the, the taking pictures precisely when there's nothing to talk about, okay? Um, one of the problems, of course, is that uh, particularly we can fall into established cultural norms of, of seeing, and as a consequence, it can limit experience to the search for the photogenic. So we spend the whole time walking around looking for an insta moment and not actually seeing and experiencing things directly. So there's a lot of debate about that. Um, there is a question about whether we get desensitized to shocking realities through excessive exposure to images. Of course, debates about pornography very much relate to that. Um, one important thing about photographs is that photographs can gain value for simply because they get older. They don't necessarily have to artistic value. And I think about this, particularly in Tokyo, where so much of the city is knocked down, all the, the house that was here today is gone tomorrow, that those snaps that you took with just something you didn't care about, the landscape, um, the cityscape in the background actually is made more valuable over time. So then a final, a final point, we think about visual literacy. We're in this world where everything is so visual. Um, so much communication, so much of what comes to us is not just, not just in fixed images now, but even in moving images. These really interesting questions of the, therefore, uh, do we have higher levels of visual literacy? One prominent scholar in the journal of visual literacy writes, um, that exposure to visual information does not necessarily lead to visual uh, literacy, to the ability to decode and create visual images, okay? And it's kind of challenging the digital native's assumption, okay? So in short, even being able to take a lot of photographs with a digital camera and whatnot does not equate to the ability to create effective visual communication through the application of design principles and techniques nor does it show the way to analyzing the visual work of others. And indeed, there is an argument that when we can take endless photographs simply because we have so much storage capacity on our phone, I'm thinking of upgrading my phone. I thought, well, I get 128 gig and my current one's 128. And I actually looked at it and realized it's still, um, after four years, it's still half empty. And I take uh, a lot of snaps for your videos. So it is really quite sobering. So we take unlimited numbers of images and as a consequence, we get a lot lazier in terms of um, framing and composition. It's just one basic point. Um, my years of working as a photographer, when I used to shoot rolls of 36 film, and you had to calculate that every single one of these, if I'm getting them printed, was going to cost me something like, you know, 100 yen um, for each image. And if I use up a roll of 36, I've got to load another film, and it's expensive. So you're very, very careful about taking an image. And I remember when I was first learning to be a photographer, I was told, um, yes, you can fiddle with things in the dark room, but the easiest way is to get it right in the camera. It's um, these days, I think we tend to take photographs rather like the US military uses ammunition. They tend to put a lot out there and hoping that they hit something, um, which is not what most militaries can afford to do, but what we can digitally afford to do. So I'll stop it here because I want to go out to the breakout exercise and I'm amazed at how quickly the time flies. Uh, but this breakout exercise is hugely important. If we don't cover other material, then I'm not worried. I can always do a video to camera piece and we can carry some stuff over to next week. So I'll stop this share. Okay. Um, so the, I'll take us to our, oh no, I don't need to put the slide up. You know that um, our breakout, uh, topic here, of course, is the university campus. What does the campus mean to us? Uh, what functions does it provide? What value does it provide to us? You know, what does it evoke when we think about the university campus? 
So let me throw you into some groups. You have the task. Um, I want you to talk amongst yourselves. Hopefully you've already done what I asked you to do when I sent the, uh, the text. Think about a word or a short expression or something. And um, I want you to take, take notes of those words. And then I want everyone to, particularly the ones you come up with yourself, take ownership of your own words. Um, I want you to simply, when we finish the breakout, uh, just type them in chat and I will be able to completely capture these um, in chat. And then later on, I will actually edit them up and share them with you. So we'll go to the breakout rooms. So uh, if you can think about some relevant words there, just uh, I want to see a huge number of um, posts now. Just, just give me words, individual words, two or three, two or three words, whatever. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, it was very interesting uh, going into the different groups. I got to uh, see that um, people are in lots of different places. Some groups had their cameras off, which was really weird. As I said to them, imagine being on a university campus at night with no lights on and kind of walking around, <laughs> kind of uh, having conversations with people, but never seeing their faces. Um, one of the advantages of a university campus and being in a room with a couple of hundred of people is you feel like you're part of something bigger. Um, you also get to see a lot of people, even if you never get to know them. And if some of them go on to be famous or notorious, at least it gives you a bit of a boost um, or a boast in the future that you can say, well, I went to university with that person. Um, he was an idiot then and he's an idiot now. Okay. Now that he's been arrested um, or the other, the other way around. Um, that uh, people go on to become spectacularly successful. Um, and then you can tell stories about how stupid they were at university. And um, so that always has lots of currency. So actually a number of um, people I went to university with are in very prominent places in Australia. Um, one or two of them in prison, <laughs> which is quite interesting, but it's uh, all good to tell stories. Okay. So yeah, let all those texts, um, pour out there. Now, while you're doing that, I just want to flag the topic. I'm just, uh, I've only got just a couple of minutes. Um, I want to just kick off the image selection and then I'll finish up with it next week. I just um, want to emphasize a couple of things. When we choose images in advertising, uh, of course, we're about showing the product. We're about showing people, of course, um, people like us or people that we want to connect with, maybe aspirational personas, uh, trusted celebrities. And of course, in social media, this is a huge issue. Uh, we also want to obviously create an attractive visual context for the product. Um, and we want to create an overall ambience, a look and a feel. You know, if you think of how German cars are advertised, they're typically winding roads, um, normally uh, just after sunset. So uh, they evoke um elegance calm the potential threat of dark but the sense that's but because you're in a german car you're feeling all secure and successful then you pull into the driveway of a lovely house and you feel like you're a bit of a champion okay all you need to do is just add add audi and life is good so so many so much advertising um is really about promoting aspiration through an emotional connection okay it's interesting to think, does that apply to universities as well too? Um, maintain, the main theme in this set of slides is really about ambiguity and the risks of visual ambiguity, but also the possibilities. Until recently, it was thought that images should be very clear in terms of their intent. So they tended to focus on the product and an ideal user using the product, kid eating a Vegemite sandwich or something, for example, normally with text, text very clearly anchors it. Um, when it's not, there are various ways of talking about this. And I've mentioned some of the texts here. Um, inherently, visuals are more open though. So very often we use verbal anchoring to attach the meaning that we want audiences to, to take, okay? Um, one of the problems is that very often we have a clear purpose in mind when we choose an image, but other unanticipated meanings can be drawn or maybe no meaning is taken. People just simply don't read the image in the same way that we think they will read the image. So testing of images becomes absolutely uh, critical. 
particularly if people are bewildered by it, if they struggle to make sense of why am I seeing this? Okay. Um, it's just another thing to process and people don't like having their processing energies being taken up. Um, Roland Barthes I've already mentioned, but I particularly want to just draw your attention to Umberto Eco. Um, if you're looking for an uh, interesting novelist to read, if you've got time on your hands, uh, a novel such as In the Name of the Rose, for example, is uh, particularly interesting. So he's emphasized that both text and images open to multiple interpretations. But also, uh, there's an important broader point here too, that when we tend to use graphs and tables, and a lot of people just will throw data in to give their paper, their essay, their report, or whatever, their presentation, um, the appearance of authority. They seem to have closedness, you know, a graph and whatnot, but actually they don't. Uh, people can bring completely alternative uh, explanations to the visualization of data, for example. So it's actually quite a perilous thing to do unless you've really thought about it. On the other hand, if you're going to do a presentation and you're not really sure how much time you're going to have to, to give the presentation, one trick is actually to put data in that you're on top of it because data can be a 30 second story or it can be a 30 minute story. Okay. And I'm conscious that I've run out of time. So I'll leave it there. This is where I'll pick it up from next week. And we'll talk about different types of open ads. Okay. Um, these rhetorical figures, the riddle, the story, the issue, and the aesthetic. And I'll just show you these two images, get you to think about them yourselves. This one here, a bit of a confronting image. This, of course, is a facial cream that removes crow's feet, which I have very badly. Um, but in the process, a bit of a gag that people have to solve it, which means they've got an engagement with the, with the message. Um, but on the other hand, a little bit confronted by the image of actually brutalizing a bird. So probably counterproductive. This one, think about, uh, we'll come back to next week. Uh, this is uh, for Eastpac, of course. Uh, and it's a funeral of the vaguely kind of Eastern, Southern Eastern European, bit of a Romanian kind of look to it or something. And it's this open question about how did the guy die and why is he's obviously he says his young bride uh, carrying his backpack during his funeral procession. So interesting kind of thing to think about. Okay. So uh, let's leave it there. I'm, I'm just astounded at how, how little work we get to, to do in this period of time. Maybe I'm too long winded. Uh, it was a bit slow kicking off. Um, I'll do some extra visual, um, video on demand and carry over the, um, all the work on color and whatnot um, to the next class. You've already primed us with the, uh, with the poll. So keep happy and healthy. I'll hang around if people have got any questions. And uh, tonight I'll launch that poll and I'll send a um, email to everybody telling you that that has happened. So thank you very much for your attention and look forward to talking to you next week.